everybody. Here it is Monday, the 11th of March, 2024. Welcome back from spring break to everyone. Uh, welcome to the second half of the spring 2024 honors lecture series on mental health and the good life. I'm Dr. Mary Evans, a professor of history and director of the MTSU American Democracy Project. And I am an Honors College faculty member, a resident faculty member in the college, and a professor of record for this spring's Honors Lecture Series. My happy charge uh, this afternoon is to introduce our speaker for today, who is Professor Sarah Harris of the Nutrition and Food Science Program within the larger Department of Human Sciences, which is part of MTSU's College of Behavioral and Health Sciences. Professor Harris is a registered dietitian, and at MTSU she teaches sports nutrition, principles of nutrition, community nutrition, and nutrition courses for the MTSU School of Nursing program. Pro Professor Harris is also a lactation consultant, if there are any nursing mothers in our midst. Um, I know Honors College actually has at least one nursing mother, mother right now, perhaps there are more. Professor Harris has worked in numerous capacities as a dietitian and dietary specialist over the years prior to her becoming part of the MTSU faculty in 2021. Professor Harris is actually an alumna of this Honors College. And if you want to go upstairs and pull it off the shelf, you can read her Honors thesis. It's not online. I guess she wrote hers before they were digitized. It predates 2013. Um, which is when those started going in digitally to the Walker Library. So you'll have to go upstairs to the Honors Library in the hard copy thesis section, and you can find her alphabetically under the A's. Her maiden name was Achelpol? Achelpol. Achelpol, back in 2010, before she became Sarah Harris. She wrote then on students' exercise and well-being vis-a-vis student stress. So she was pursuing understanding of well-being uh, and physical and mental health, even in those days, 15 years plus back. And she continues along that topic to the present day. After MTSU, she went to the University of Memphis and she earned her MS in clinical nutrition and was part of the Student Dietetic Association there. And currently, she's about to complete her PhD also in this disciplinary area. Today, she's here to talk to us about food and mood and the impacts of nutrition of students and peoples mental health and how they impact mental health. So let's warmly welcome here back to the University Honors College, Professor Sarah Harris. Thank you. You really dug up some things there. You asked, somebody asked for a bio and it was very small. Very small bio and that was not what I said. <laughs> so thank you uh, for that introduction. It's great to be here. This is a packed house and I, I recognize some visiting friends over there. Um, is anyone in any of my classes, my online classes? I know we have some nutrition majors that are in the Honors College, but they may not be in this class. Alright, so, All right, so um, like she said, I'm a dietitian, a nutritionist, um, and have been for over a decade, um, and started here in 2021. So. Um, our agenda for this lecture is to examine the effects of what, in my professional opinion, as a dietitian, um, just and in my personal life. I'm going to bring some of my own stuff into this. Um, what are the heavy hitters when it comes to nutrition and mental health? There's <clears throat> so many, and I have 30 to 40 minutes, so I'm not going to hit on all of them. But um, there are some big ones that I am going to hit. So we're going to look at the effects of alcohol, caffeine, hydration, calories, sugars, and then specific six different or eight different specific mood boosting nutrients on mental health. So those are the ones that I'm specifically focusing on today. Um, so please feel free to ask questions at any time throughout this. Um, I want this to be as interactive as it can be. I'm going to take a little verbal poll of how we're all feeling today, since this is on mental health. And I was going to do this fancy like plug-in on PowerPoint where you make a word cloud and everybody fits in how they're feeling on their phone. But I teach online classes that I'm very rarely like in front of a group of people, and I love this. So we're just going to use like our mouths <laughs> and bodies instead of our phones. Um, so how are we feeling? Good. 
Emotionally, we've got some decent, a lot of good. Not ready for another week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all been just slammed right back into it. Yeah. Any like emotions festering? Tired. Tired. Hungry. Frustration. Stressed. Frustrated. Didn't get enough done over spring break. <laughs> Did not catch up like he wanted to. Oh no. <laughs> we'll say happy notes. Happy. We're mostly in the positive here. I'm feeling a lot of joy today and gratitude just for having this opportunity, so that's kind of how I'm feeling. Um, I'm actually not tired, and I did catch up, so I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, I never really knew how spring breaks would work as faculty, but I don't think many of us actually take spring break on spring break. <laughs> I've since learned that, so. Um, all right, good. Well, that's great to hear from everyone. Thank you for those that, that participated there. All right, so I'm going to start by kind of digging into my own mental health really quick, kind of set the stage of where I'm coming from. So I identify as a neurotypical, which, you know, that's kind of a buzzword, neurodiverse, neurotypical. Um, but I've had, you know, my own experiences with situational anxiety, situational depression, um, as I think many of us have. Um, I've had a small number of panic attacks. In fact, I had my very first panic attack here at MTSU in Dr. Janet Colson's uh, nutrition class. And now my office is right next to hers. Um, so it's funny. Um, but, you know, I was, college is heavy. There's a lot going on. Um, and just like all of you, I had a lot going on um, and was mis misusing my body and um, consuming things that were not good for my mind. And that manifested as anxiety, depression, and panic attacks. <clears throat> I was going out on Thursday nights to Stampede's. Is that still a thing here in Murfreesboro? Stampede's, anybody? Define. It's like a club. They would have um, country music until like midnight, and then they would turn on rap, hip hop, people would dance. No, I must not be around anymore. <laughs> Where do y'all go out here, those of you that do? <laughs> Does anyone? I am talking to honor students. <laughs> <laughs> I was an honor student. And I was, okay, um, well maybe it's just me. So I would go out on Thursday nights. I would wake up Friday mornings for an 8 a.m. class. I would take it. Oh, when I went out, I must add, I would drink um, alcohol, and they had dollar beers at Stampede, so plenty of opportunity for drinking there. Um, I would get up for an 8 a.m. class, I would take caffeine pills. I was in a sorority, I was working more than 20 hours a week, I was in the Honors College, I had straight A's. Um, my grandmother was sick, there was a lot going on, and then here I was abusing things that you know, wouldn't normally think are necessarily that bad, alcohol, caffeine, you know, everybody does it, right, it's not illegal. Um, of course I had a panic attack though, right? <laughs> um, and I would. I would guess that um, you either have experienced something similar or maybe know someone that um, you know has gone through that type of thing. So that's me, neurotypical with the occasional situational anxiety, depression, panic attack. So um, I don't have the perspective of a neurodiverse um, individual that's taking medications or struggling through some of those mental health challenges. Um, I do have individuals in my family struggling with that, so I see it from their perspective, but. I just want to clear the air that I really can't come from a position of a neurodiverse person here. So that's my, the limitation of my knowledge. Um, okay, so um, I will say I'm three years sober this April um, and I have been completely caffeine free for two and a half years. So I'm looking at this, I've been, um, you know, in the situation where I was not treating my body well, and I'm now in a situation where I feel like I am, um, and I feel better than I have ever felt in my life. I'm 35, you know, like I'm, it's only up from here. Um, so just wanted to share that <clears throat> to let any of you know that maybe struggling that there is hope and there is such goodness in being free of some of these things. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to start with a big hitter. So alcohol is a depressant that disrupts the neurotransmitter balance in our brain. It affects our feelings, our thoughts, our behaviors. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know here, and I know that. Um, it affects the part of your brain that controls inhibition, makes you do things you otherwise wouldn't do, makes you feel temporarily relaxed, um, less anxious, more confident, uh, but it's not permanent. These effects do wear off. Um, the chemical changes to your brain swing the other way into negative feelings such as anger, depression, anxiety. And I was going to draw a graph, but there's nowhere to draw anything here. So, um, you know, the graph would have been something like that, and then you'd have a big smiley face here and a frowny face here. Um, you know, and you have the alcohol, you know, you drink and you're up here, right? And then the effects wear off and then you're back down. And so you drink again to get back up, and then it's this up and down and up and down. And you'll see throughout this talk that the goal of nutrition and mental health is to get us on a, a homeostasis of sorts, a happy medium, like right in the middle, right? Um, not where we're having these huge swings, because that's where our mood can get really off kilter. Okay, so a 2016 meta-analysis found that a reduction, so just a reduction, not even a complete elimination of alcohol, uh, can decrease the pre prevalence of psychiatric episodes. It can decrease the prevalence of um, dura uh, the dura duration, sorry, of inpatient hospital stays. It improves anxiety and depression symptoms, improves self-confidence long-term, and contentment with life. Um, it lowers so psychosocial stress levels and improves social functioning. Um, so we're going to look at where we stand in our drinking habits. <clears throat> Moderate drinking is one drink per day for women and two drinks per day for men. So that's kind of what's recommended as a healthy um, amount of alcohol to consume, that much or less, right? Binge drinking is around five or more drinks for a male within a two-hour time period and four or more drinks for a female in a two-hour time period. So those nights that I was going out at Stampede's was certainly classified as binge drinking. And then heavy alcohol use is defined as five or more drinks per day or 15 drinks per week for men, and then four or more drinks per day or eight or more drinks per week for women. So, you know, you think of, of someone just having a glass of wine or two at night, every night, that's technically heavy alcohol use. <clears throat> so post-college I fell into that rhythm of having one or two at night and I thought that was totally normal. There's this mommy wine culture. I don't know if, and you know, y'all are probably way too, I don't know, do any parents in here? I knew I'd have some. Okay. Um, and I don't know if y'all are on social media, but it's, you know, there's a, there is a culture of that this is normal. Um, but, you know, I was, this was heavy alcohol use, and I didn't even realize that, that it was heavy use. Um, <clears throat> but it actually started to affect me physically, which is the reason that I stopped drinking. <laughs> um, reflux will catch up to you <laughs> as the years go on. So you can look at these classifications and see if you're considered to be, you know, the sober category, moderate, binging, heavy drinking. And then kind of compare that to, um, are you struggling with anxiety, depression, or an increase in anger or discontentedness with life? Um, and, you know, kind of think through, could this be affecting that at all? So what can you replace an alcoholic drink with, either some or all of the time, to help reduce consumption? So my mantra as a nutritionist is always to replace one thing with another um, and have a plan for what you're going to reach for in place of the thing you're giving up, whatever that thing is. So, um, for me, for a long time, that was soda water <laughs> was my go-to drink of choice. I always had these with me. Um, if I went, if I was ever was at a restaurant and there were other people drinking, I would get a soda water with lime that looked like a drink, you know. Um, <clears throat> so that was kind of my replacement. Um, but there's so many other like non-alcoholic options now. There's Athletic Brewing Company has a really great line of beers that actually have good taste. And then there's non-alcoholic wines. There's so many options. Um, and I used to make fun of people <laughs> that drank those things <laughs> until I became one. And I'm just so thankful that they exist, you know. Okay, any comments or questions about alcohol before we move on to the next one? 
Yeah. Why LaCroix? I, that's, I, date night, Friday night, and I, we went to Publix for date night. And this was a splurge. I don't usually get LaCroix. It's pretty good though, it's the mango. Can't, uh, can't agree with you there. Uh, I hate LaCroix. Yeah. But, uh, each own. What do you like? Yeah, what is your preference? Uh, there's, have you ever had the uh, sparkling ice? You know what those are? Yeah, those have a lot of other things in them. I don't know if you read the label. We'll get there, but it's artificial sweeteners and flavors and things that are fine in moderation, but that I don't really like the taste of. Yeah. These are just straight water with like an infusion of flavor. There's like nothing else in them. Ingredients only carbonated water, naturally essenced. The, and those have, the ice drinks have. I don't even know what we can look at that in a minute if we want to. Anything else on the alcohol subgroup? All right, so next one is caffeine. And I I I realize that I sound like the fun police here. I, I get that. If if I I can picture myself sitting where you are, I mean like, okay, yeah, you know, this is obnoxious, you know, but it is what it is. If these are true things, you know. Um, that I've lived through now at this point. So I wish I'd had this talk when I was your age, actually. I could have come back to it in my mind, you know. All right, so caffeine is found naturally in tea, coffee, and cocoa. It's frequently added into sodas, energy drinks, and things like pre-workout supplements. And back in the day, I would take it in pill form, and 200, it would be 200 milligrams per pill, thinking that that would keep me awake in class after a night of drinking. Bless it. Um, it is classified as a drug. It acts as a central nervous system stimulant. It works by tricking your nerve cells into thinking that it is adenosine, which is another neurotransmitter. Adenosine normally will slow down your nerve cell activity, but caffeine actually competes with adenosine on the receptor, um, basically replacing it, and speeds up ner nerve cell activity instead, which is why you get that alertness. Okay, so when the pituitary gland in our brain senses that that nerve cell activity is increasing, um, it releases chemicals that spark the production of adrenaline, which is our flight or fight hormone, um, which gives us that up, you know, we're ready. When we have that cup of coffee, we're ready, right? Um, <clears throat> that's where that comes from. So, um, yeah, that's why we get those physiological changes when we drink um, coffee or other caffeinated beverages are pupils dilate, our heart beats faster, our blood pressure rises, our muscles tense up, we're alert. Um, so drinking caffeinated beverages also increases dopamine. And dopamine is also a neurotransmitter. Um, it activates the pleasure centers in our brain. This is the mechanism by which we become addicted. What is the inevitable result of adrenaline and dopamine wearing off? Much like the wearing off of alcohol, we get the opposite response, fatigue and depressive symptoms. <clears throat> so what do we do? More. Um, we reach for more, and then that cycle continues. So once again, the graph. Happy, down, right? We wake up, we're kind of down, we drink the coffee, the, the coffee or whatever caffeinated beverage you want. But we're up, and then it wears off and we're down. And then we need more, and we go up. And then, you know, the this, this cycle. So when you're doing, you know, alcohol and caffeine, you wake up, you're up, down, up, and then when you fall back down on caffeine, you don't want to stay up all night. Or maybe you do, and then you reach for the alcohol and it's up and then it's down. <laughs> then we're just all over the place. Okay, so when consumed regularly, you can easily develop what is known as caffeine tolerance, which requires you to drink more and more to, to receive the same baseline effect from caffeine. Um, all right, so research uh, shows that every four out of every five adults, so most of us, are consuming caffeine on a daily basis. How many of y'all are consuming caffeine on a daily basis? <clears throat> so it takes about 18 to 24 hours after your most recent caffeinated beverage for signs of withdrawal to surface. You get headaches, drowsiness, impaired concentration, difficulty working, and then depression, anxiety, irritability. Nausea, vomiting, muscle aches, stiffness, the withdrawal from caffeine is pretty rough. And it starts in within less than 24 hours of your last drink, which is why every 24 hours we need more. Um, and then if you don't kind of chase those withdrawal symptoms with more, that withdrawal can last a week, um, up to a week typically. Um, and I can vouch for that because when I stopped drinking caffeine, it did definitely last 
it, probably two weeks, I would say, with me. Um, and it's not fun. <laughs> Don't ever want to do it again. Genetics definitely plays a part in how a person reacts to this. Um, so some are far more sensitive to its effects than others. It's generally recommended, I need to point this out, that if you have an anxiety disorder or sleep disorder, or if you're taking stimulant medications, you would be most likely to benefit from a reduction or elimination of caffeine. Let's look at how much is too, how much is, oh, wait, oh, I have a little video here, but I'm gonna skip it. Does anybody remember the five hour energy commercial? You got that 2.30 feeling? Um, that's what that was, but I'm, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip it. Maybe. Hello. All right, so how much is too much? Moderate consumption is considered 200 to 300 milligrams per day. When you start to exceed this amount, up to 400 or more milligrams per day, that's when you may start experiencing shakiness, insomnia, headaches, dizziness, an elevated heart rate, um, sometimes even dehydration, because those beverages that have caffeine can also be diuretics. Anxiety and a dependence on the drug. So, there is a caffeine chart <coughs> over here and click on that, where you can see ooh, how much. This is a very slow mouse. Um, you can see how much caffeine is in certain drinks. So, <coughs> does anyone want to see a certain drink that you have every day? I want to point out first, though, just a venti regular pipe place roast from Starbucks has 410 milligrams of caffeine, which is puts you in the over the moderate consumption. And that's just one. Um, so if you're, it's so easy to, like you starting your day with that, you get the up, you come back down around lunch, and then you reach for a five hour energy or a bang or a monster, and then you're up to five or 600 milligrams of caffeine in a day. Um, and wondering why you feel really bad. <laughs> Any drinks that I want to look at? Matcha, tea, matcha. Oh, I don't know if I can search on this computer. You're good with your matcha. It's 80. <laughs> Alani's? That A L A N? I think so. A L A N I. That's not on here. Sorry. You're good with your black tea. So Starbucks is kind of a, a big one. Um, and then you're like, um, so what I was doing was I would drink coffee in the morning, probably too much. I don't even know how much. And then I would have a bang in the afternoon. Those are 300. So I was easily over 400 milligrams. And <clears throat> kind of with alcohol, I was having really bad reflux and joint pain and just the most random symptoms. And um, they're gone now, so it must have been one or the other for me. But I want you to go back to the power one. Oh no, how do I go back to the power Can I go? It's the third tab on your support. Thank you. Mm. Nope. The green dot. I, <laughs> I tried to switch from a PC to a Mac and failed miserably. <laughs> Evidence of that. Okay, so those are some of some common um, caffeine related beverages, and you can see how much is in them. So uh, once again, you want to have something to grab instead of that um, if you're wanting to reduce or eliminate what you're drinking there. So um, lots of decaf alternatives to our favorites, decaf coffee, decaf tea. Um, and then you can reach for other things like smoothies with you know, a ton of fruits and um, pro like Greek yogurt, protein powder, things that can actually um, nourish your body. Because um, when we're tired, sometimes just what we need is nutrition. Um, okay, any comments on caffeine before we move on? Yeah, I just want to recommend Ticino because it, it's T-E-E-C. 
C, maybe two C's, I and O. It tastes very much like coffee, but it's made with mushrooms and oh yeah, I've heard of that. Um, and it's it's really good. And there's no caffeine. Thank you. Do you know where you can get that? Online. Hmm. It's not a regular grocery sh grocery store. I'm saying. Mm, I might have it at Publix or something. All right. So, and then also you can just drink water because maybe you're dehydrated. Um. And now this isn't working. So. Do I have to? Oh. All right, so speaking of water, we're going to move on to hydration. Um, so although their body is made up of 60 to 80 percent water, our brain is actually composed of the highest percentage at 80 to 85 percent water. It's one of the hungriest organs in our body. Um, it's, it eats up a lot of what we consume, not just uh, fluids, but also the nourishment that we consume. So the CDC reports that dehydration can cause unclear thinking. It can result in mood changes. It can result in fatigue. And when you're feeling tired in the afternoon and get that 2.30 feeling, you know, is it lack of sleep? Is your caffeine wearing off? Do you need more water? <clears throat> Those are things you have to think of, about. And again, the graph um, of hydration. It won't be as up and down as alcohol and caffeine, but we do still get those ups and downs in mood and alertness when we are dehydrated. So there was some research conducted on soldiers that were exposed to extreme heat and varying levels of dehydration that showed that short-term memory, numerical ability, psychomotor function, and sustained attention were all negatively affected by dehydration. <clears throat> but follow-up studies failed to consistently confirm that. But what was confirmed was that um, mood was found to for sure correlate with um, water consumption. So, our mood, uh, individuals reported in research feelings of calm and alertness following water consumption. So if you're feeling low, maybe step out in the sun and grab a cold glass of water um, instead of any other substance, maybe that's all we need. Um, a nap and some water. <laughs> it cures so much. Okay, so how much do we need of, that's not gonna work. <clears throat> oh. Oh, I may have already been on that. I don't know if I'm on the right. If I was on the right slide before, I apologize. So, how much do we need? The rule of thumb is one milliliter per calorie that you consume. So, um, if the the general amount of calories consumed and what our nutrition facts labels are based on is 2,000 calories per day. So, if you're eating around that amount, you would need eight to eight and a half cups of fluid each day to meet your hydration needs. And again, I'm pretty sure I'm not telling anyone. Anything they don't already know <clears throat> about that. So um, obviously that changes based. So if you're uh, an ultra endurance athlete and you're consuming three to four thousand calories a day, your fluid needs are going to need to increase to match your calorie consumption. Or if you're in an energy deficit and you're drinking or you're eating thirteen hundred calories a day, that intake would go down. So some tips. Um, for hydration, keep your favorite water bottle handy. handy. I was going to see how many Stanleys were in the room, but there's none, I don't see. <laughs> I don't have to call anybody out. <laughs> I still don't own one, but it's been fun watching all the reels and things, making fun of Stanleys. It's just fun. Um, bottle or tap water is fine. You can add lemon, lime, orange slices to naturally flavor your water. You can add a little... 100% uh, juice to your water to flavor it. You can freeze a bottle overnight and then take it with you throughout the day and drink it as it melts. Um, that way you always have cold water. And then try to reduce caffeinated and alcoholic beverages because they can de actually dehydrate you um, if consumed in a large enough quantity. So. There's a Blue Raiders Drink Up campaign at MTSU and this fun little map. <clears throat> One of the things that they did was, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to click it. There's a map um, if you Google MTSU Blue Raiders Drink Up map, there's a map of all the drink refill stations on campus. So they've put a lot of money into making sure we can just go refill our bottles with water here, which is pretty cool. All right, so we, we're reducing our caffeine and alcohol consumption. We're getting our mood more stable. We're hydrating. Um, so what about a Sprite? Um, that's caffeine-free. It's alcohol-free. 
would that help hydrate and stabilize my mood? <clears throat> Any opinions? Mm -hmm. I feel like with the amount of other things that there are in the Sprite, that would probably not help to that extent. Yeah. It may not be the best one because of sugar. sugar. So while Sprite may be superior to alcoholic or caffeinated beverages some of the time, it may not be the best choice. Um, the drinks you want to shy away from to rehydrate would be those that are really high in sugar, like a Sprite or your regular sodas, specialty drinks from like Starbucks or wherever your favorite restaurant is. Um, and in this section, I want to be clear that I'm talking about processed added sugars, not naturally occurring sugar in our food. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a common scene, a girl experiences a breakup, she's sad, what does her friend bring over? Ice cream. Ice cream, a tub of ice cream. Um, so why do we reach for sugar when we're feeling sad? What? It's a good it tastes good. Well, it also really affects our brain. So similar to caffeine, sugar increases levels of dopamine, which are a happy chemical. Um, it's our happy neurotransmitter. So that's why we call it a sugar rush. We rush up, we're up, we're happy, you know. This has made me happy now. Um, do we stay up? No. no. Just like alcohol and caffeine, we're up and then it inevitably comes back down. So we have that, those big ups and downs. All right, so we've, um, all right, so eating sugar does increase dopamine. It also decreases cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So we feel less anxious. We feel so happy. Um, seems great in theory, but again, that withdrawal period includes symptoms like anxiety, irritability, confusion, and fatigue. And sugar withdrawal actually can mimic a panic attack. So if you're ever having your own panic attack, um, if you reach for some juice, like 100% juice, it can actually kind of draw you out of that if it's a sugar-related um, anxiety that you're in. So, a little fun fact. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering if you can get uh, sugar withdrawal headaches because I think that may have happened to me before. Yes. Yeah. Anything that that pulls you up that high, what sugar does, again, it affects your brain so much that yes. Um, it can also maybe like if you're eating a lot of sugar. May, you may not be as hydrated either, so it could be a headache related to dehydration. Where are we here? Okay, so a study out of China found a connection between sugar consumption and inflammation and neuron damage in the brain. Um, other researchers from UC Davis found that sugar was able to inhibit cortisol, like I said before, um, in healthy females, which lowered feelings of anxiety and tension in the short term, but overall increased reliance on sugar to continue to get those same effects. That increasing reliance on sugar is the problem that leads to long-term increases in anxiety and depression. A 2017 study found that men that consumed 67 grams or more of sugar every day, which is not hard to do, were 23% more likely to receive a diagnosis of clinical depression within the next five years. All right, so how much do we need of sugar? Six teaspoons per day for women and nine teaspoons per day for men. I don't know why they don't recommend that in grams because who's measuring it in teaspoons? That's not how it's listed on the nutrition facts label. Um, but another way you can um, measure that is 10% of your total energy intake. So if you're eating a 2,000 calorie diet, that would be 200 calories from sugar. Sugar has four calories per gram, so that'd be 50 total grams of sugar per day. <coughs> All right, so some mood boosting tips there. Oh, can anyone guess how many teaspoons of sugar are in a Sprite? Just throw a number out. Ten. Four? Just a 12 ounce can of Sprite. <clears throat> Ten. Close, I don't know, who was that? Ten, so it's actually nine mm -hmm. um, teaspoons of sugar in one can of Sprite, which, check, you've gotten, you know, as a male, you would. I would check off all of the teaspoons of sugar that you would need in a day. Um, so some mood boosting tips for sugar. Choosing fruit or honey as a sweetener over processed added sugars is a better idea. 
um, eating a variety of whole grains, fruits and vegetables to make sure you're getting the right amount of carbs because sometimes if we're low on carbohydrates, we'll reach for that processed added sugar. Carbs are not an enemy, but added sugars can be. Um, read nutrient, nutrient fat labels on your favorite food strings and condiments and see if you can find a lower sugar alternative. I was going to explore some labels, but for the sake of time, if we have time at the end, I can do that. Um, but I wanted to kind of show you the difference between like a Yoplait strawberry yogurt, which has about 14 grams of sugar um, and about 4 grams of protein versus like Oikos Greek yogurt has 0 grams of sugar and about 14 grams of protein. So it's like flipped. The, the protein and sugar ratio, but they're both yogurt. So it's very interesting. You can have the same food item that you think is healthy, uh, but if you're not reading those labels, you you know may be actually choosing something that is similar to eating candy, you know, for breakfast. <clears throat> All right. Anything about sugar before we move on? Okay. Well, that's that. We'll come back to that if we can. All right, we're going to move into calories. So you may think I'm going a certain way with this, but um, it may not uh, be what you expect here. So calories are just energy that we consume through our foods and drinks. Um, and you may be thinking that I'm going to tell you to eat less calories because 40% of us are overweight or obese. Um, that's, yeah, that's not where I'm going. Your brain needs nourishment to thrive, and you need an adequate amount of nutrient-dense calories to perform physically, academically, feel your best. Um, so the truth is a large percentage, sometimes even up to 50% of college students are considered to have low food security, where they're unable to access or afford a nutrient-dense, balanced diet for optimal health. This uncertainty that students feel about how or when they might be able to afford their next meal can lead to stress, anxiety, depression, hunger can affect concentration, and academic performance. So the point I'm making here today is... Um, about calories is that as a student you need to make sure you're consuming an adequate amount. Not even just of calories, but of nutrient dense calories for your mental or physical health. So you know, and which which type of food is cheaper? An ultra processed food that's high in sugar and fat, a yo play strawberry yogurt or oikos. Which one's more expensive? The oikos, the one that's high in protein and low in sugar. So those food items that are the best choice for us are often more expensive. Um, so when you're food insecure and you're, you know, you don't have, maybe you have, you know, you're okay with money, but like you have to choose between a textbook and going to the grocery store. Um, you know, it's it's easy to pick those things that are more processed and higher in fat, sugar, salt, all those things. <clears throat> um, so the. The research here, um, a qualitative study in college students found that food insecurity increased students' experience with sadness and hopelessness. Food insecurity is associated with a 257% higher risk of anxiety, a 253% higher risk of depression. But on the bright side, research has also found that using food programs, food pantries, SNAP, like food stamp programs, um, can increase food security and psychological well-being. And that's actually the topic of my dissertation research, um, is food insecurity in college students, because it is um, wild how many of us are struggling with um, affording adequate food, um, especially those of us that don't live with parents, that are living on our own, um, <clears throat> especially now with inflation. I don't know if anyone's noticed grocery prices, but they are ridiculous. <laughs> uh, we're spending like twice the amount of groceries that we were three or four years ago. Alright, so how do I know if I'm getting enough calories? The rule of thumb here is around 30 calories per kilogram of body weight. So if you want to do some math, you take your weight in pounds, divide by 2.2, and then you've got your weight in kilograms, and then you multiply that by 30. And that's the around about amount of calories that you would need in a given day. Um, again, that will increase if you're really active. It might decrease if you're more sedentary or if you're trying to lose weight. But it's generally somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 40 calories per kilogram of body weight. So if you're dealing with food insecurity in any way, it's important, first of all, to know that you're not alone. It's not weird. Um, there's no shame associated with it. It is a season of our life that, you know, we're here, and um, there are things out there that can help. Um, 
but yeah, choosing those whole grain carbohydrate foods like rice, beans, baked potatoes, stuff like that, in place of empty calories like ramen noodles where there's not there's not much nutrient, it's just basically carbon salt. Um, <clears throat> there's actually nutrition, vitamins, minerals, and such in beans, potatoes, rice, things like that. Um, choosing fruits over candy or other sweets. Canned or frozen fruits and vegetables are just as good as fresh, often cheaper. Um, prioritize protein as snacks and meals if, as you are able. Um, we have a food pantry here at MTSU that you can actually order. Um, there's a link there, but you can actually order food from the pantry online and pick it up without anyone knowing who you are or what you ordered or anything. It's awesome. Um, one thing I know, they have a ton of peanut butter. So if you go on campus and you need some peanut butter um, or anything from the pantry, you can go get that there. Um, and then there's also uh, food stamps. So if you're working 20 hours per week um, and you're a student, <clears throat> odds are you're probably not making above the threshold of the financial eligibility threshold to receive SNAP. Um, I received it as a grad student because I applied um, as a kind of a experiment. Um, I was consulting with students on health, their health goals and things, what I did as a graduate student at the University of Memphis. And um, I had a student that couldn't do anything I was asking him to do because he couldn't afford any food. He was out of money. And so I applied and I actually um, got enrolled and was able to use that for the rest of my grad student time, which was really helpful. Um, like I had parents supporting me, but it was nice to kind of free it them up um, with that responsibility. So. <clears throat> okay, so what time do y'all end? Okay. okay. So some heavy hitters, not these aren't the heavy hitters, these are the smaller ones, but these are just happy foods that help to boost our mood, um, that have nutrients that are great for us to consume. So I'll go through these quickly so we can have a little discussion at the end. Omega-3s are found in fatty fish like salmon and tuna and plant sources like flax seeds, chia seeds, and walnuts. The omega-3 fatty acids, docosahexanoa, docosahexanoic acid, it's also known as DHA, and docosapentanoic acid, or EPA, they've both been linked to lower levels of depression. Fermented foods, which are really hot right now, way more so than when I was um, many of your age. Um, those fermented foods, kimchi, yogurt, kefir, kombucha, sauerkraut, they're all considered probiotics, which are microorganisms that help support growth of healthy gut bacteria and help to lower depression and increase serotonin levels. Serotonin, again, is the neurotransmitter that affects mood and stress response, and 90% of our body's serotonin is actually produced in our gut. Vitamin B6 is next on the list. It helps synthesize dopamine and serotonin. <clears throat> and foods that are high in this B vitamin include fish, chicken, bananas, sweet potatoes. Bananas keep coming up a lot. They've got a lot of stuff in them. Um, so maybe if you're down, grab a banana and some water. <laughs> sweet potatoes and spinach <clears throat> also have vitamin B6. And then there's fiber, of course. Fiber helps to slow down the digestion of carbs and sugars. Um, it leads to a more gradual release of glucose in our bloodstream and helps to prevent, you know, how we have the sugar rush. It helps to prevent that rush and keep us on a more level playing field there with the carbs so we don't have the crash um, that comes after that. And fiber is found in whole grains, beans, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, all those types of foods. Magnesium um, is a good one. It is linked to lessen anxiety levels as well. Some rich sources of that include dark chocolate, which is good news for me because I love dark chocolate, avocado, nuts, seeds, beans, tofu, whole grains, fatty fish, bananas again, leafy greens. Tryptophan is on the list as an amino acid that's responsible for producing serotonin as well. Um, almonds, cashews, peanuts, walnuts, and then pumpkin, sesame, and uh, sunflower seeds. So nuts and seeds are all really good sources, as well as chicken, turkey, and tofu. Anthocyanins um, is a flavonoid that is associated with a 39% lower risk of depression symptoms and can be found in all berries, so all your raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, as well as black beans and red onions. It's essentially any of those foods that have a really deep red, blue, or purple pigment to them 
have those anthocyanins in them. And then the last one is L-theanine, which is found in tea. So that actually helps elevate dopamine and serotonin levels, especially when it's combined with small amounts of caffeine. So like in tea, you get that, I think, what was it, 70 milligrams or so of um, caffeine in the tea. When that combines with L-theanine, you actually get an, an even more improved effect of the reduced anxiety and boosted mental clarity. Um, yeah, so that comes in black, white, or green tea. So those are <clears throat> um, some little fun things that you could add into your diet for a little mood boost. Some resources for anyone that is struggling with addiction. Um, there are services. I don't know. I'm sure people share this a lot. I don't know. In this lecture, I would hope they are. But there are there's things here at MTSU um, for anybody that may be struggling with um, addiction. Um, <clears throat> mental health issues that you want to address, um, and if you have, you know, if you're dealing with food insecurity, like so many of your peers, you've got food pantry. There's micro grants here at MTSU that can help you get through a rough time. The SNAP program. There's food banks. I'm gonna just leave that up there. My next slide is like a Q and A. I'm just gonna leave that up there and open. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes. So for questions or exploration of nutrition fact labels <laughs> or whatever, however we want to use this time. Oh, I'm sorry about my voice. I have allergy. I don't, all the things um, moving. It makes me sound squeaky. <laughs> I have noticed that. Can you talk about different sugar substitutes? I know some of them are definitely better than others. Yeah, so they... They are all generally fine. The problem is when you, I don't know if you've seen on TV, like the woman that drank like four or two liters of Diet Coke a day. If you're consuming artificial sweeteners in really, really high amounts, that's when the risk of negative effects come, comes into play. But they don't cause that shoot up that sugar rush. You know, you don't get the spike in insulin levels, you don't get the crash. Um, so it's helpful in that way. Um, but you just want to make sure you're not, you know, using it in excess. So like our natural ones, like stevia or monk fruit or something like that, better than sucralose or aspartame or anything like that? I'll be honest, I don't know the specific research um, I'm not even sure anyone knows okay. if, you know, if one is like very far superior to another. Um, I do know there's countries that don't use certain ones that we do use, but that's with lots of different food additives that we have that we'll use that Europe won't, that they've banned in Europe, you know. Um, I think stevia is one of those, but that's a natural one. Um, and I am so... I question all nutrition research because when you read the studies, they are typically funded by Stevia or Sucralose or the company that's trying to get you to buy more of that sweetener. And it's so hard for me to read any of those studies and think anything of them. But I do know that if you're if you're taking in anything in excess, then there can be negative effects from it. And also just knowing yourself well, like if you try a certain sweetener and you notice you have some, just being in tune with your own body. Um, if you introduce something new like that, keeping tabs of how it affects you, because that, our artificial sweeteners, just like caffeine, genetically can affect one person more than another. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of a hard question to answer. What is your opinion on water flavorings, like the zero sugar, zero calorie water flavorings, like? Mio or something like that. What is your opinion on those? They're a great alternative to a sugar sweetened drink. However, they can cause major gastrointestinal upset because they have sugar alcohols in them. So if you've ever drank something like that, like a Mio and had excessive gas or diarrhea or constipation, basically any, it kind of throws off your gut a little bit. Um, but it can be a good alternative. Again, not using it too much. If you're using a bottle of Mio a day, that probably that might be too much. <laughs> but a squirt here and there and something's fine. 
Um, I don't know if a lot of students can agree, but for me it's very hard to vary my diet because I just get stuck buying the same things all the time. What would be your recommendation to like get your diet varied or not get set eating the same things every week just like from around the campus? That's a good question. I, I generally don't see a whole lot wrong with kind of eating the same things as long as they are meeting your needs for protein and calories, like if you're, you know, getting enough food. But if you're eating the same things and all of those same things are ultra processed or really high in sugar, salt, or fat, um, that's where you can run into nutritional deficiencies. Um, one really good tool that I like to use, that I use with my students and myself sometimes, I'll, I'll log my intake on there just to see where I'm at, is my fitness pal. It is a free app that you can, <clears throat> I don't, I'm scared of the Mac, so <laughs> I don't, I don't want to pull it up, but it's just myfitnesspal.com. You can make a, it's free, you make a, um, an account on there, and you can type in just everything that you need, and they have the best of what I've found. They have all <laughs> foods in there from all different restaurants that you can type in and see, you know, so you could put that regular, however you eat daily, you can put it in there just for one day, run it and see what it looks like and what you're lacking. <clears throat> there is a dietitian on campus. You could do that and take it to the dietitian. Say, help me, can I, can I somehow make these same foods that I eat better and match what my needs are? Um, yeah, there's a dietitian that meets with students in the in health services. Uh, what's, your, what's your opinion on like keto diets and stuff like that? Is that like generally healthy or is that more kind of like depriving you from like it? I think it's like no carbs generally and sugars, but yeah. yeah you know, one, one thing that I've noticed is really popular right now is the carnivore diet, like the mm -hmm. lion diet. Has anyone seen that on? Mm -hmm. um, I am really interested to see how that goes along because that's a fairly new um, trend. Just, it's basically just eating red meat. So I'm interested to see how that goes long term. But the best way I can state this is that that is going to totally vary from person to person. So for me, I don't eat meat because I had high cholesterol. Um, I run marathons. I am like generally a healthy person. I eat like generally healthy. Um, but I had high cholesterol in all areas of cholesterol, and I cut meat out, and my cholesterol is low. So me, I, I don't eat meat because of the way it affects my blood chemistry. And um, but not everyone's affected like that by meat. We're all affected so differently. So if you're if you're getting your labs drawn annually, you know, going to the doctor and checking up on things regularly, and you have a good idea of how your body responds to things. Um, and your body responds okay to a diet like that, you know, go for it. It's not, I, I teach sports nutrition. It is not good for an athlete, I can say that. Because um, they need a lot more fuel, a lot more nutrients, and the, just the protein doesn't match that. Um, but for certain people, it might, you know, it's great. It's hard to keep that up consistently long term, that type of thing. It's not impossible. Um, just kind of adding a little bit to the uh, two questions ago about the repeated foods. Uh, I don't know if this would be more of a question for a dietitian or anything, but what if you were someone that's very picky when it comes to what you eat? What sort of advice would you have for that? That is definitely a dietitian thing that, that could help so much because you could. You could list out all those foods that you love, and they can look at it and say, well, you might be deficient in, you know, your protein levels are a little low, or it looks like your calcium might be a little deficient, or maybe you're not getting B, the B vitamins that you need, stuff like that. <coughs> um, but, I mean, yeah, yes, to answer your question, that would be a dietitian thing. But then what the other part of it was, ask your question one more time. Oh, I was just saying, uh, if you, for someone that um, is very picky about eating food, yeah. 
what sort of recommendations would you oh, have? Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, I was going to say take a multivitamin. Ah, uh, fair enough. <laughs> take your Flintstone. <laughs> You'd be, I mean, there's there's no shame in that. I picky eating is super common. There, thank God for multivitamins. Yeah. Sarah, you mentioned in passing salt. And it seems to me that a lot of snacks are really high in salt. Ultra-processed food seems to be really high. Does it affect mood, or is it? It's not in your list of things that you yeah. talked about. Salt's not so much of a brain. Um, it doesn't affect the brain as much as the others that I talked about. Um, it can affect your blood pressure. Um, it can make you feel bloated. You know, it can make you carry more water. But as far as like the brain chemistry, it's not as affected by. Of course, if you are hyponatremic and you have low sodium levels, it can make you really confused. But in that case, you'd be more. <clears throat> That's pretty rare, though, unless you have a medical disorder or if you're an ultra endurance athlete sort that's sweating out a lot of salt. We're right at 3.55. I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you.